questions. Um, I'm going to keep this kind of short. I want to talk to you about the different types of permitting that the State Department of Agriculture provides to beekeepers. So, one, there, there's an exemption from permitting. So, if you have your own hive on your property, or if it's on someone else's property, but you're specifically the only one who's caring for it, and you're only selling it from your own property. So if you have a roadside stand, something like that, then you would be exempt from the permitting requirements of the Department of Agriculture. So, and then from there, we have two types of permits that we would issue if those aren't the qualifications that you would need. We have a limited food establishment license, and then we have a food establishment license. And there's a couple of variations between those two. If you have a home kitchen that you're going to be using to extract the honey, bottle the honey, that's when we would issue what's called a limited food establishment license. And all of these permits are available, the applications are available online at uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture website. It's a little hard to navigate the site, so if you do have any issues with that, feel free to email me directly and I'll get one out to you right away. So with the limited food establishment license, it's the $35 a year registration fee. And essentially what you would need to do is fill out that application, mail it in or email it directly to me. I cover all of the Chester County area. So if you're looking to get licensed, you're going to be dealing directly with me. So hold on to that email, hold on to my phone number, um, because if you have questions, I'm the one you want to talk to. So, Getting back to the limited food establishment license, you can use your home kitchen for that. There are some exceptions. So if you have pets in the home, those pets cannot have access to the areas that you process in. So if you need to use your kitchen sink to clean your equipment, they can't have access to your kitchen. If you're using your basement to extract, those pets cannot have access to that basement. Yes? You mean ever or? while you're in process? Technically, it should be ever because there's potential residue that can mm -hmm. be left behind by those animals. Um, so, you know, we can certainly make exceptions in situations where it's a seasonal operation, like this would be, um, where we would say, okay, between these months, one, we need you to clean and sanitize everything, and then we need to see some type of barrier that you have up to prevent those animals from getting in there. So if I have like a separate eight by eight room with my sinks and everything set up, the door that closes, mm -hmm. that can count. That would be fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We just want to see that there's something like there, or we don't want, you know, cat hairs, dog hairs, getting into things. Yes. What about Delaware County? Who does Delaware County? Delaware County mm -hmm. is split between a couple of different inspectors. I do have a portion of Delaware County, but then we have another inspector, um, Melvin Higgs, who does portions of it, and another inspector, Tony Sellers. What area of Delaware County? Media. Media. I believe that's Tony Sellers. But I will say, if you have questions, feel free to email me. Even if it's not in my region, I can help you out. The rules are the same for everyone. So, you know, you've got my info. Feel free to bombard me with questions. Um, with the limited food establishment license, it's basically the same price. We're kind of unique in the state of Pennsylvania where we do come into homes and we license them and inspect them on a regular basis. So unlike other states, when you have that limited home processing <coughs> license, you're allowed to sell across state lines. So in other states like Delaware, New Jersey, uh, Maryland, they don't actually go into those private homes to inspect them. So they're not permitted to sell their products across state lines. In Pennsylvania, you are. So that would include internet sales, sales. Um, if you did farmers markets in other states, you would still be allowed to, to bring your product across state lines. Yes. So once we're inspected and approved and whatnot, um, can we have an Etsy site, for example? Yes, absolutely. And what I always recommend to you, um, and it's not required, and we'll get to a little bit more on labeling in a bit, but go ahead and put that, you've probably seen it on things, registered by PA Department of Agriculture. That's like a nice advertisement to your customers to let them know that you're a little, a little bit more legit than maybe <laughs> the other guy on Etsy who's making cake pops out of their kitchen, you know. Um, so in addition to that limited food establishment license, we have a food establishment license, which 
is kind of the next step up. This is the same license that we issue to like HERS, um, any kind of processor. That is the main big license. Um, the difference between these two is one, the food establishment license, you're gonna need commercial equipment, a separate processing, not in your home. Now, if you're able to convert your basement into a completely separate entity, you're not gonna be using anything for personal use, then this could be a food establishment license situation. Um, typically, what we're looking for for both of these licenses is a place with hot and cold running water, soap and towels to be able to wash your hands, an area where you can clean your equipment in a sanitary manner, and we need to make sure that your water source is a safe water source. So this would go for any type of licensing that we have. If you're on well water, there's two tests that we're gonna ask you to get initially. One is coliform, total coliform, and the other is for nitrates and nitrites. And I know that there isn't an addition of water to honey, but we're looking at your cleaning equipment with this water, you're washing your hands with this water, we need to make sure that there aren't residues that could potentially become an issue to the consumer. Um, initially, you get those two tests. Assuming your nitrates and your nitrites are below the threshold of 10, which is for a safe water source is recognized by the DEP, then we would allow you to go ahead and start processing. Your total coliform should also be zero. If not, if you do show that you have some coliform in your water, we would ask you to take it to another level and have them test specifically for E. coli, because that's the one pathogenic bacteria that we're really concerned about with the coliform. Um, as long as that is zero, then you would be good to go. Anything over zero would not be acceptable, and we would ask you either to not process or to put some type of system on your water so that it can um, take care of that bacteria. So that could be a UV system, reverse osmosis. Um, I don't re recommend that reverse osmosis if you are on um, a private water with well because that's going to fill up your well or your, your septic system pretty quickly. Um, so once you have that initial testing, we do require that you have coliform tested once a year after that. If your nitrates and your nitrites are an acceptable level below the threshold of five, then we wouldn't require you to get testing done again. If it's above five, below 10, there's different um, requirements, like every three months you might need to get it tested, depending on the range that it's in. Yes? Could, could you talk a little bit about um, what kind of configurations you've seen that's the because you've seen extractors, they're not a small item that you can just throw in the kitchen yeah. sink. And so, you know, you're talking about people with hoses and outside and high pressure fine processing in garages. Can you talk about that? I mean, what? how do people work around all that if they don't have a place in their house that um, they can do all that big stuff? I would say the majority of what I see is done in a basement. So people are converting a space in their basement for this processing for cleaning. In some cases, people are posing things out down, outside. Um, typically, we don't want you to do the extraction outside because we want to see some kind of overhead protection. Mm -hmm. um, so if you had a shed outside, the issue there would be, do you have a place to wash your hands, right? Sure. So yeah, that's for me. Number one is hand washing. Um, everything else kind of falls in line. Yeah. Follow up. Does it matter where we store the extractor if it gets uh, cleaned and for whatever before it's? No. As long as you're cleaning it and potentially even sanitizing it before you use it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you were storing it in your garage over winter, I would say sanitize it before you start using it. And I will say the nice thing about my beekeepers is that they are tend to be very particular and very clean, and they want to take very good care of their honey. So that has never been an issue for me. Um, yeah. Must it be hot and cold, or can you use uh, hand rubs? So you do need to have hot and cold running water. Okay. Yeah. Back to that gentleman's question. In the garage, I've extracted honey in my garage for years. Yeah. Just keep it all closed and keep it clean, whatever. Yeah. Just keep everything closed. You know, the big issue for us is we don't want want to have rainwater. We don't want to see any um, dirt or mud blowing it. I mean, I would think the majority of you probably aren't doing it in the pouring time rain like today. <laughs> Um, but that's the idea behind having the covers um, with even sidewalls. Second question. 
In terms of bacteria, I understand that honey actually extracts moisture from bacteria. If the bacteria doesn't grow in honey, what's the concern about bacteria as long as everything is reasonably clean? I, I personally do not have a lot of concern about bacteria in the honey itself. Okay. It has to do with a residue like nitrates. So nitrates and nitrites aren't bacteria. Um, it's a chemical contamination. So as far as the water tests are concerned, that's one of my bigger concerns um, because we don't want to have that residue on the equipment when you're bottling the honey. Okay, we're going to go left and then right and then back yeah. to you, okay? What do you consider sanitizing? I mean, so is that Clorox, uh, a percentage Clorox solution, or, or what? Good question. So we follow the FDA's regulations on improved sanitizers. Um, the most frequently used ones that I see, some people prefer to use bleach, which is fine. Um, there are test strips that they sell. They are not the cool test strips. Um, these are specifically for reading a range between zero and 200 parts per million of bleach. We're looking for a range anywhere between 50 to 150. Um, it's almost always in the middle range of those test strips. Um, that's just kind of how they're designed. So um, you can use bleach. If you don't want to use bleach, there's quaternary ammonium. And if any of you have worked in the food business, it's usually those blue tablets that you'll see at bar. Um, a lot of places prefer to use it because it's a little easier on the skin. It's less likely to pit stainless steel. So when you have your nice extractor that's made of stainless steel, you might want to consider using that just so that you're prolonging the life of your equipment. Wait, I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna go in a row. Go ahead. Okay, if I'm considering getting a limited license, mm -hmm. um, so I extract my garage, it sounds pretty common, uh, and have an adjoining um, laundry room for the sink and that can be closed off you know, from the house. Um, is that generally a reasonable configuration? It is. I do, the only thing is we don't want to see a partition between your area where you put the hand wash sink and where you're actually handling the honey. It's but so if you leave that door open or if you can open it without having to touch the handle, then that would be acceptable for us. Okay. So, you, so you can leave it open. I mean, that would be acceptable. Yeah, I'd like to see some way to make sure that it's being left open. Yeah. A lever handle rather than a knob? Is that, is that, is that concern? I mean, you, know, you can open it up with your elbow. You could open it up with your elbow. And I will be honest, there is a lot more flexibility in the limited food establishment license. I would not accept a door for a food establishment license, but I would for a limited food establishment okay. license. Because when you have a food establishment license, it's like another step yeah. up. Then we're following the Code of Federal Regulations, which tends to be more specific. So the process for applying for license, yeah. first you get your water tested, and yeah. then submit the application? Yes. Yeah. And then along with the application, I would like to ideally see the labels that you're going to be using. It's pretty straightforward what you need to have on your labels for honey. Um, one, we don't need an ingredient list because there's only one thing. Um, you are, in fact, not allowed to add anything else. Uh, if you do, you're not allowed to call it honey. Um, in addition to that, we want to see the weight of the product on the container. Now, some people will have labels printed with you know, a blank ounce because they have different containers they're putting it on or it potentially be different weights. I do recommend that if you're starting out and you have different size containers only because this way you're not having to have different labels printed constantly. Um, you need to have the name of the product, honey, and you need to have the city and state of where you're located. If you have a corporation, it can be the location of your corporation. If it's not um, located the same place where you're bottling, or you can put the bottling uh, city and state and the name of the manufacturer. All right. I use sodium bisulfate as a two tablespoons per gallon for sterilizing everything. Is, okay. that, is that adequate? The sodium bisulfate is fine. Um, just make sure that it's not a high enough concentration that it's leaving any kind of residue behind on the equipment. Yeah. Two questions. Sure. Um, what are the typical things that uh, cause failure, you, you not to pass someone for the limited license? Yeah. And two, outside my kitchen, um, can I be keeping mules and cows and whatever? Outside the kitchen? Yeah. Sure. You okay. can keep whatever you want outside your kitchen. Okay. I'm only concerned with your kitchen. Okay. So as long as those mules aren't coming into your house and you're the kitchen, <laughs> then that is fine with me. Okay. Um, in fact, I would say we do have a lot of farmers who have animals and also do honey. And 
typically, that's absolutely fine. Okay. Okay. Um, and my other question just was, what are the typical things that you end up oh, citing? Oh, that's right. So, I've only ever one time had a limited food establishment fail for gross sanitary conditions. So one of my requirements is that I need to be able to walk into your home and see the corners of your wall. Okay? That was why this one person failed. It was not in this area. But <laughs> it's another area. If I can't see that you don't have pests running around your house out in the open, then I can't license you. The most common um, cause for a failure to be licensed is the water, quite honestly. Um, especially, depending on the area that you're located in, the amount of runoff that you have from farmland can affect your nitrates and nitrites. I recently had one person in the western portion um, in the Oxford area fail their nitrates and nitrites test in the last couple of months because of all of this rain. So when you have this amount of rain, it's going to it, it can affect your well water. It's going to maybe add um, coliform from animal waste runoff and nitrates and nitrates from fertilizer runoffs. Okay, I've been skipping over you. I'm okay. sorry. Can you talk a little bit about cross contamination? Sure. So the, the idea of cross contamination is allowing filth to get into a clean area. Or in the restaurant business, it would be like storing raw meat over cooked vegetables. It's the idea that you want to have a barrier between clean and dirty. Um, so typically with a processor, when I would see <coughs> contamination, it would be from like overhead roof leaks um, or even your hand wash sink where you're washing your hands. We want to see some kind of space barrier between where you're actually setting your clean equipment or your food products so that we don't have that splash. So that would kind of be, I think, what would probably be more applicable to the honey. Did you have something specific that you were thinking um, of? Just dress code, cross contamination, yeah. so hair things. Okay, yeah, when you're processing, we do want to see that you have clean clothes on, um, wear shoes, have your hair secured in a manner that, you know, the main concern with hair is we don't want to see hair in the food. If, if I get a customer who has hair in their honey, they're going to call me, um, and then I'm going to call you and come out and say, what's going on? Um, start pulling the hair back. But in general, you know, I would say the 95% of my processors are very good about keeping those, what we call good manufacturing processes, which is just making sure that you do have clean clothes on when you're, when you're uh, processing. Hair is secure. Um, we do have a rule against direct hand contact on ready to eat food, which honey would qualify as. So if you are gonna to be touching the honey, you should have gloves on. There are exceptions in food processing where you are allowed to touch food with bare hands um, because there are other operations like candy where they still hand dip things or they have hand molds and um, they have proven to the FDA that as long as the person who is standing in that position does not leave that position to go use the bathroom, go do something else, pick up trash, then their hands are clean enough that it's not going to leave any kind of bacterial residue on the product that they're using. I have one more question. Sure. Would you accept a picture of the area rather than come out for the inspection? No. We do need to physically come out and it's just the area. Thank you. What sort of a, a partition or a barrier is I've got a small dog, um, I've got a porch that I can extract off of, I can walk into the kitchen, it's got lots of the hot water and all. But um, will, will a dog gate while I'm working be sufficient or do we actually need a door to partition off the kitchen? If the dog gate was sufficient enough to keep the animal out of that processing area, then that would be acceptable. While the process is going on. Yes. Okay. During the season that that processing is going on, which I, I don't want to see during the the season. Like if okay, for example, if you have a cat or a dog, yeah. this is my reasoning behind this. If you have an animal that's in that area, they're potentially tracking things in on their paws. When you walk around that room, you're potentially picking up what they've tracked in on their so paws. It's not just during the processing period. It should be during that whole season when you're processing. Which is basically the summer. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
Can I ask you a question about the farm stand exemption again? Yes. Uh, I extracted my home, but I have my hives at my sister-in-law's farm, and I have a honey stand at the end of her lane at her farm. Yeah. Would that qualify as fall under the exemption? I'm going to have to check on that one. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it would because okay. it's not your property. Typically, the only exemption is if it's your property. I had to check the particulars on whether or not if it's under your control or if it legally belongs to you. So if you could say that I'm, I manage this area, because that could maybe fall under the same idea as renting land even if there isn't a money exchange. So I'm going to look into that one. But on the, on, on the PA uh, guidelines that we've got, that's, 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 acceptable. that's not acceptable. It's not acceptable because you don't know. Yeah, let me look into the particulars because yeah. sometimes that's slightly more, that's a little more of a specific situation. So I will email him somebody in here who's heard about that. Where's the extraction taking place in that scenario? His house or the system? Yeah, where house? is the extraction taking place? At my home. Not at the farm. Okay, no, no. In that case, it would, it, you wouldn't be exempt. Okay, yes. Uh, my two questions. Number one, do you come out and inspect while the person is extracting? So, ideally, we would love to do that. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't always happen. So, what we'll do is kind of walk through the process with you. Um, so, you know, like I want to know what steps do you take first, what do you do, right. how are you cleaning things. So even if we're not visually seeing you do it, um, we have a good idea of how you're doing yeah, it. Walk through the steps. And my second question has to do with cleaning and sanitizing. You mentioned these tablets. Yeah. Where do you purchase them? So typically you can buy them at restaurants, supply yeah. stores. Um, Amazon. Yeah. Amazon. Yeah, yeah, or Amazon. Like I mean, you're soap? not required to sanitize things because this is not a product that typically grows bacteria. Okay, so but if you're storing your equipment in an area where it could have become contaminated, that's when I would say sanitize. Because we wash out our extraction with like fish sticks. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, as long as you're not getting some kind of gross contamination from where oh, you're okay. storing the product, you're not required to sanitize your equipment between years. A good washing is fine. Okay. If you're on public water, I take it to hold the bait without being tested. Oh, yeah, right. if you're on public water, that's yeah. somebody else's problem. That's someone else's problem. Those records are on file, and they will definitely let you know if they're failing tests. <laughs> right. One back to the scenario: uh, I'm bottling in my home, but I have hives in other locations. Does that kind of still qualify for a limited home kitchen? Yeah, you can definitely qualify for the limited home kitchen. Um, yeah, that would not be a problem. We would just want it. Uh, we don't, we don't go out, I don't go out and inspect your hives. I just want to see the area where you're processing. Okay. Second question, can a large bathroom with a small shower be used as a process? No. No, we would not allow bathrooms to be used as processing areas. Okay. Ooh, what, what, why not? Um, what if it was to never be used as a bathroom again, yeah. then potentially yes. But we, we would need to see something in writing from you saying that it's not. I mean, if you're converting a bathroom into a processing area, then that's fine. But there is a potential for contamination from coliform, um, just from things like flushing toilets, um, things like that. It, it can aerosolize to a certain degree. So is it the, the toilet in the bathroom that would cause the problem, or the showers also? Mainly the toilet, I guess? It would be really the toilet. Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming nobody's doing anything questionable in their shower. <laughs> the um, definitely the toilet. <laughs> yes. So, is there are the requirements on the temperature of the hot water for the hand washing? And have you ever seen anybody use a mobile uh, sink that is not connected directly back to running water, like with with, uh, with a holding tank. tank? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. We see that a lot with our mobile uh, units. So it's, it's the same idea, and that would be fine. Um, we would just need to make sure that from your freshwater holding tank that it meets specifications so there's no potential for outside contamination from rain, things like that. 
and also that the holding tank would be, I believe it's, it has to be 33% larger in capacity for the wastewater so that there's no potential for overflow um, given whatever you might be adding. Oh, for the wastewater. Right. right. Um, and we want, depending on the situation, if it's outside and that's why you're doing that. In a garage. In a garage, yeah, then that would be fine. And the temperature? The temperature is an interesting question. So we go by the Code of Federal Regulations. It's um, Section 110 and 117 for uh, general manufacturers. And it does not specify an exact temperature for hot water, but clarification from Harrisburg has said we want over 100 degrees. So you could take a tank of water from your home, out of the garage, put it on top of the hand washing sink, mm -hmm. and use that as hot and cold running water. Um, so it could not be gravity fed. It needs to have a pump system Ooh. for a permanent license. Hmm. Yeah. For even a, a temporary? A temporary, a temporary license, no. A temporary license, and that only gives you 14 calendar days in the same location to do any kind of processing. And is that annually, or do you do that every year? Mm -hmm. be temporary. You can renew it every year. Yeah. For the 30 bucks or whatever it is. Yeah, uh, I think a temporary license is like 14. But the problem with that is that that's only available to a retail operator. So you would essentially have to have the location where you're doing it also be the location where you're selling it. You wouldn't be able to then take that product elsewhere and sell it. Because that's only for retail, so direct to the customer sales. That's usually specifically just for things like festivals, special events, that's when we would issue permits like that. Um, but I mean, if you have 14 days of the year where you're, you'd only want to sell your honey, then, you know, then we could work something out. But you'd have to get permission from Chester County's Health Department because they handle all of the retail sales in the county. So you have, just so it has some type of pump that would pump the water through yeah. the spigot is the only limiting that, factor. Yes. So get creative. Foot pump? I've seen foot operated things like for campers. Yeah, foot, a foot pump would work. Yeah, as long as it can provide you a continuous flow. Um, and you don't have to potentially turn something on and off. Um, like, I'm kind of going on to another section here, but that for retail, um, we wouldn't allow like Coleman coolers where you have to turn the nozzles and have it going on. You wouldn't, that wouldn't be acceptable. So it has to be a continuous flow, like on and off. That way you don't have to put the knob. Exactly, and you can't really wash your hands while you're. That's not, no. That's I, not you, you bridged over to talking about a temporary permit. Is that what? That's yeah. only for retail sales. Temporary permit, because it's not to be confused with the limited license. Right. You talk about uh, issuing a temporary permit for a 14 day period of special service. That's only for retail sales, though. Yeah. So, what everybody, if you're making something in your home, <coughs> you're probably not going to get a license from Chester County Health Department. Mm -hmm. Um, the only way you're going to get a license is through us. So we have a lot of home bakers um, or honey people. We will permit their home as a small processing area for certain types <coughs> of foods, honey being included. And then they would have to get another license to go out and actually sell their food to the public. So if you have the food establishment license, you can sell directly to grocery stores, farmers markets. Um, you can sell on your land as long as it's pre-packaged. Typically, Chester County won't even permit you if you're at a farmer's market or something like that. Um, and you have permission to do that from the state to, to make that product from your home. But the actual retail sales of it is governed through Chester County's Health Department. Yes? After you come out to my house on September 18th at 11 o'clock in the morning, yeah. <laughs> and we pass the flying colors, yeah. Then, like, in, in following years, then what? Then I'm going to come out once a year. Oh, once a year. Okay. Yeah. So, technically, you're on an 18... Well, when was it I was at your house? I'm sorry? When was it that I was at your house? You're going to come September 18th at 11 o'clock. September 18th. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, I spoke to your wife. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, so, well, yeah, technically, if you're creating a non-potentially hazardous food, um, we put you on an 18 month schedule. I will not put any of you on an 18 month schedule only because I want to be there when you're 
it's closer to the season. So I don't want to be there when you've got all your stuff in storage and it's covered up. I'd like to see kind of your, your setup. Storage. Uh, what are the requirements? Does the storage area have to be the same area as the processing area? It doesn't have to be the same area, but it's something I would want to see while I'm at your home. So if you are planning on storing it somewhere else, I'd like to see that area. Okay. I'm looking to make sure if it's something like an attic, I don't want to see exposed insulation uh -huh. over the storage area. Um, I don't want to see any evidence of critters in that area. And well, I'm less concerned about spiders and more concerned about mice. So uh -huh. spiders typically aren't carry; they're not um, carrying anything. Mm -hmm. It's roaches. Um, mice, and then a plethora of other little things. But ants, I'm not as concerned about spiders. I'm going to want you to keep it clean, but <clears throat> I would also ask that you cover that equipment um, while it's in storage. You may not like this question, but what is the penalty if you sell your money and if you haven't been inspected? So. It doesn't matter where you sell them on. Well, if you're selling on your property. Right, but if I take it to my church, it's also the presence. Okay, so here's the thing. <laughs> we are not in the business of trying to prosecute people. If I find your product somewhere, you don't have any kind of licensing, I'm going to contact you and I'm going to tell you, you need to get a license. I'll send you a cease and desist letter. And then if you continue to do it, then it becomes a problem. I don't like to prosecute people. It's a lot of paperwork, and I just don't <laughs> like it. So if you get a cease and desist letter, just cease and desist. Contact me. We'll figure something out. OK? Yeah. How about when you test the water? Is there some kind of special, you do need to put it in a sterile container? Do you, yeah, so this, this isn't testing that you can do yourself. Right? This is something that you would need to have a professional laboratory do for you. Um, we do, I can't recommend any laboratories as a state employee, but we do have a list of approved laboratories um, that the state has approved. And I am more than happy to email that list out to you. It's also available on the Department of Agriculture's website under laboratory services. So do you need a sterile container or do you need just um, to put I it think clean? typically they provide you with a sterile container and okay. then you usually mail it into them or they have a sampler come out and take a sample for you. But when they're doing that, we do need you to have the samples drawn in the room that you're going to be using as the processing area. So don't have them go like somewhere in your bathroom that you're not going to be making honey or extracting honey. I want it to be actually at the site where you're going to be using that water. Yes. With the exemption, is, is it simply an exemption or do you actually have to have an application for an exemption? No, you're just exempt. You don't need to register. It's fine. And that's, does that also apply if you're going to give the honey away? Yeah. If you're just giving your honey away to friends, that's yeah. fine. Okay. Yeah, because you're giving it to them directly. I mean, you whether know, or not it takes place on your property, right, that you know. Is, that is the point. Yeah, I'm not going to come and sit outside your house and wait for your friends to show up. So <laughs> don't worry. <you> know. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't have the time for that. Okay. <laughs> um, the really, the red flags are for us. It's when we see your product in stores and we just don't know where it's coming from. Yes. What if you buy? It? I believe I know a person, he buys it by bulk. Yeah. And he reprocesses it. He, he packages it and he sells it. He can do that as long as he has a license. He needs that on the label or? He doesn't need to put it on the label, but he can't make claims like local honey. So, yes, there are false claim issues um, with honey, and I can get into that a little bit. You, you can't state that it's a specific type of honey unless you have some kind of guarantee. Like you know your hive, you know what they're feeding on, but you can't say this is clover honey when it isn't actually clover honey. I mean, obviously you're gonna have a little bit from other things, but what they can actually do, if there's a question about it, um, we'll actually take a sample and test for what's in that honey. Um, I will say I've never had to do that because usually people are pretty transparent about it. Or you don't even have to make a claim that it's a clover honey. You don't have to specifically say on your label what type of honey this is, um, where the bees were. But you can't say it is one thing when it actually isn't. But well, you still need to you have don't a have license to, say, to repackage. Yes, you would need a license to package someone else's honey. 
but you are allowed to do that, and you don't have to state on the label that it is someone else's right. name. Right, you just have who? Right, you just have, I know. But, but you, can't, can't, you can't say local either. You can't say local if it's not local. And I know my next question is, how do you, what's, what's the radius local. of local? <laughs> I do not have an answer for that, and I looked last night, and I could not find an answer for that, but I can contact Harrisburg and ask them to get more specific on that for me. The official one is 10 miles. 10 miles radius? 10 miles. Okay. Because that's not a very big. It's not very big. I mean, I would have thought it'd be much larger based on the variation of plants in that area. It's yes. 50 mile radius, and the third definition is USA. Okay. All right. USA? So, <laughs> no honey from China. How about that? Label so that. Uh, it's basically made in the USA. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, 10 mile radius to be legit local. To be legit local. To be legit local. That's 10 mile radius. Well, then what, what's the 50 mile call? So, that's what it used to be. That's what? Oh, it used to be. It used to be. So I don't have a permit and I decide to sell my home. So I don't want to call an aggregator. I can do that. Or do I have to be permitted to sell it to an aggregator? I don't know. No, we don't need to be permitted. Not by me. Now maybe by the bee inspectors. But if you have honey, I guess it would depend really on who's collecting it and what kind of containers you're putting it in. If someone's just coming onto your land and collecting the honey that you technically own those hives, they need to be licensed. Okay. If you're extracting that honey on your land, like bottling it in large containers and selling it to somebody, yes, you would need to have a license. You okay. would get the processing license. Can you describe the scenario again? You were saying an aggregate, but you weren't sure what to call it. I have 50 gallons of honey, and I don't know what the hell to do with it. So I'm going to go over and sell the swarm bust, and he puts it in his big bag and sells it to the swarm bust and honey. That's okay. the long for sure of it. Okay. But if I had to get a permit, I'm going to be giving a lot of honey away. And then he calls it local. Yeah. <laughs> but you're not selling it for human consumption. See all these honey on the shelf. I don't do anything unless it's in the state of Pennsylvania. The FDA would regulate it because it comes from over state lines. And I will say that periodically the FDA does take samples of honey to ensure it's actually honey. Um, so there's usually the red flags for them is if it's really cheap. Um, and, they'll pull and do it. they have to put on there where the honey comes from? No. Mm -hmm. yeah, Can we get back to the labeling? Okay, so you talked about. Um, you know, you can't, you can't put local on there unless it's within a 10 mile radius. You can't claim, um, you can't, you can't claim it's a certain type of flower. Unless it actually is. But would that require like a certain acreage of that type of plant to be around the ordinary for the hive? I mean, like, I mean, I, I know heat can taste, oh, this is, this is yeah. linden honey, or this is goldenrod, or this is, uh, you know, certain certain buckwheat coming in, but the newer beekeepers, like, how do you know unless you know? That, that's what I'm saying. Like, I would maybe just not do that then. Like, if you don't know, then don't put it on your table. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, how many people think they know? Well, I mean, that's when we would challenge them, I guess. If, if, there were, if we had reason, like if Chief called me and was like, hey, Suzanne, this guy says he's got buckwheat honey. There's no way this guy has buckwheat honey. Or local orange blossom honey. Yeah. Yeah. I would be like, okay, red flag, let me go to the store, get one, send it to Harrisburg to confirm it, and then... Yeah. And is there also... Um, saying, claiming it's roll. There has to be a certain temperature range, right? Yes. So that is another claim. Um, so there are specific temperatures at which things are then considered to be pasteurized. Now, obviously, you know there's a certain amount of heating that can be involved in the process to, to create that flow and for bottling. Um, I'd have to look at the specifics, but I can't imagine that you're ever going above 120 degrees. 110. 110. Yeah. Uh, that's important. This is this is important. Yeah. As long as you're keeping it below that temperature and it's specifically just to assist in flow, then it's still raw. 
okay? If you are bringing it to pasteurization temperatures where we're then seeing like the potential for denaturing proteins, that, no, it can be much lower than that, yeah. It's based also on time and temperature. Yeah, and it's a duration to keep it. Right, and I would also say, you know, if for some reason you were doing high pressure pasteurization, which doesn't increase the temperature, um, but it, it's still a process, then you would no longer be able to call it raw. Here's a quick question. Keith might have answered this. Recently had a discussion with somebody from the guild, the Philly Guild. She was taking her wax capping, putting it in a, a slow cooker at low temperature to separate the wax into a patty and then get claim the honey from that. And I said, I, you can't claim it as raw then. You, you have to be getting that temperature too high if you're melting wax. And her, her logic was, we can melt wax in your hand, so it's not getting too hot. They did not call it raw. And I said, I don't, I don't think that's accurate. It all depends on the temperature. So you, yeah. you it's, it's 110. Yeah. yeah. Don't go above 110. 110. Yes. How about unfiltered? Unfiltered. If you're filtering it, it's not unfiltered. Well, everybody's using a screen. They still call it straining. Yeah. Yeah. Filter would be a much finer. Um, How fine? <laughs> I, need to make, I need to write these things down. It's great. It's paper. Um, I cannot tell you exactly. Goodbye, my Lord. Maybe you guys are going to challenge me to add it to my final flow. Okay. If you have honey sitting out in one of these heat rays and the sun is beating on the honey, is that some sort of natural pasteurization? Could be, yeah. So, you got to test whether it goes above a certain temperature. So it's one temperature. I mean, you can use a, a food thermometer just to ensure that that temperature is going above that temperature. I wouldn't think in a crock pot it's going to go above 110. Right. I mean, the whole idea is for a safe food, you have to hold it at 135 or higher, so a crock pot's not going to go at 110. Well, the conversation I had with her was I put my first batch of wax capping, put it in a pot, put that in a bigger pot of water, did a double boiler, swelled the mat, melted the wax, got the honey out of it. The, the honey tastes caramel. Yeah. So I, yeah, I said, if in a double boiler, it tastes it caramelized. In a crock pot, it's got to mold. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can we go back to this label some more? Sure. About, so, so you have to put the, I'm a little confused about the address you're putting on there. You're putting the address of the person responsible for the honey, or where it's being extracted, or who the person buying the honey? The processor. So you would be the processor, the location where you're doing the processing, with the exception that if you are a corporate entity, and say you, your corporate headquarters is in Malvern, but you're doing the extracting in Westchester, you could use either or of those addresses. So where you're physically licensed, that location, or where your corporation is headquartered. So. That's for traceability. For right, us. right. So, so people find, they should find, I heard there's an operation on like that. That's bringing cheap China on you and getting redistributed. People relabeling it as their own and putting their own address on it and stuff like that. So. The bad guys. What are, how are the bad guys mislabeling their labels? Like, if I was a bad guy, how could I? I'm just trying to figure out. It can probably more than likely say distributed by. Distributed by. Yeah. So like, if it's a if it's a repacker, um, and you'll see this a lot of times on like hot sauce bottles. If you take a look, they're using co-packers that actually do the whole process for them, and it'll say distributed by their company because they're not actually doing the producing. Um, so that's usually like a, a red flag for this person isn't, they're just, they're repacking and they get a repack license and that's what it is. And it's still the food establishment license, but we label them as a repacker. So that's, that's you know, how these standards standards to, to try to, to be using the product, you know, show the consumer to label, this is no for this is some sort of what's the phrase that you can put on the label, bottle by, or, I mean, I would suggest if that is like your selling point for your honey, maybe just add a little dialogue on the back of the container saying, 
what your honey is. Like this from hives located in, you know, blah, blah, blah. But there aren't, and I know there were requests years ago for the FDA to specifically address issues with honey and honey producers, but they declined to do it, and instead they submitted um, <coughs> recommendations. The only thing they really have it is the standard identity of honey and what it is. Um, but as far as the repacking is going, there's not very much that we can do other than you, you know, market yourself in an accurate manner and be truthful and, you know, give them a little bit extra. And also, I mean, I know a lot of the stores that you're selling your product in are looking for local products. And so you have that guarantee by going to stores like that. Typically, there's a specific consumer who's looking for local honey. So the fake honey guys, they should be having on their label something like packaged by. Yeah, packaged by or distributed by means usually they didn't make it themselves. Yes. So if you qualify for the exemption, you have hives on your own property, you're extracting there, and you're selling at a farm at your own farm stand, or giving away to friends. Are the labeling requirements the same? No. No, no, there's no, because you're not licensed, you're not expected, you don't have to follow those codes of federal regulations. Okay. So you're exempt from that. Okay, thank you. Do you get a lock number is there the label? For tracking purposes? Um, it depends on what kind of license you have. So if you have a food establishment license, you are going to be required by the Food Safety Modernization Act to be able to have traceability for your product. I always recommend having some kind of code identifier on your product, just so you know if there was an issue and I said, there's a potential for glass inclusion in your product, if somebody found glass in your glass bottle, you're not gonna have to recall everything because you can't guarantee that that one lot was the only lot affected. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's make four more questions. Okay, four more questions. And one of them is a repeat question that we've uh, okay. we had now. Um, our definition of honey is straining and filtering. Um, according to us, if you've got one of those stainless steel or sometimes those plastic <laughs> barriers, that, that um, you probably see one over here. Man Lake has one up. Left side? Uh, Left side on the bottom. Uh, yeah. This, uh, <coughs> Okay, you've, you've, you've got this one over here. Okay, this is very, very useful. This stops all the, uh, uh, the, the bigger pieces of, of wax. Um, either this or plastic. Uh, you know the plastic ones that fit into it. Um, this is regarded for us as straining. Okay. Filtering is when you send it through a something like a five micron filter. Okay, so we just want to ask you if that is correct in your... Yes, yeah. I, I don't so know if it's exactly five microns. I haven't um, checked. No, it's, it's not five microns. It's, okay. it's ten or okay. four. Yeah, that's what I don't know, the specific so those size. Are, yeah. This over here is straining. Okay, this yeah. is what we do. We do strain. We want you to strain because okay. we don't want those large... The, this isn't filtering. But don't strain too hard. You might hurt yourself. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Brown. I have I'll have taken one from him, I, and then I'm going to jump to you. I promise. Okay. Do you have any concerns if you're in a your extraction has windows or windows? So my only concern would be the potential for pest access. Um, so windows, we would just want to make sure that they have, they're closed or they have um, tight fitting screens on them. And vents shouldn't be an issue unless they're venting directly to outside, in which case then we would ask you to set some screen on it also so that things can't get in and out. If I buy a case of new, ready to fill bottles, what controls do you demand when that case arrives from wherever? Good question. So Okay, can we repeat the question? Did you all hear the question? No. Okay. Uh, th th this is really good. Okay. Okay. So if you have containers that you're purchasing and you get them before you fill them. Is there something you should do? Is there a control to prevent contamination? Um, yes. So if you're getting containers in, I would strongly recommend, one, if they're glass, you have the potential for glass inclusion. So take a look at the rims, take a look at everything in that container, make sure that there's no chips or cracks, because if they're glass, then you have the potential, I mean, it's hard to see, but you have the potential for that contamination. One thing I always recommend is that you clean and sanitize those containers first. 
One, it's going to prevent you from getting potential mold growth faster than you normally would because you're introducing outside contaminants. Two, um, you don't know what was going on in the factory where you got those bottles. So unless you have some kind of certificate of analysis, letter of guarantee from that supplier that they are sanitized and clean, I would both clean the containers, and that's also going to help if you have glass containers for getting any kind of glass particulates out. Same with the caps, okay? We do allow for the reuse of reusable containers. So if you have glass containers and they're in good condition, or you have specific plastic containers that are a specific type of plastic with a letter of guarantee from the supplier that they're approved for reuse, those can get reused as long as they're cleaned and sanitized fully. Caps cannot be reused, but they should be sanitized before you use them. Dishwasher sanitation uh, cycle is acceptable? So it depends on your dishwasher. I know a lot of home dishwashers say they have a sanitizing cycle, but they don't actually have a sanitizing cycle. It has to reach 165 degrees on the dish surface. There are test strips that you can purchase that turn color at 165 degrees. You can order those on Amazon or wherever. Um, you can also get what's called a stop thermometer and run that through your dishwasher. There's different settings on a stop thermometer which will hold the highest temperature that was reached. And then you can read that as it comes out. As long as it's reaching that 165, then you're good to go. Thank you. Let's make two more questions. Okay, one. Three. I do have email too, so feel free. There's a lot of treatment we know about varroa mites. And is there any residual like agrivar or something, a test for that that could be residual in the honey? I honestly do not know. And that, I mean, we always say don't take honey that had exposed to it, but maybe yeah. some of the honey is. Um, that's a good question. I know periodically we take fruit and vegetable samples to check for um, approved pesticides, but I don't know about honey. Uh, the, the risk is, uh, let's get two sides to the story. Okay, the risk of one of the hard chemicals is very low. Uh, the one that we mainly use is an amitraz based apivar. Uh, that gets denatured in a water base or a honey base, and even a wax base, within 15 days. So your honey, theoretically, I wouldn't want to do this, though. your honey is theoretically safe after 15 days of being honey. Uh, after exposure to what we use as a miticide. But uh, it's very difficult for even the, um, the, the chemical analysis to find traces of, of amitraz. But please don't eat, don't sell. If you've exposed it to amitraz, uh, please don't, it's, it's not, we shouldn't be selling it. Okay. Um, the, the, some of the other ones are food safe, but um, yeah. Uh, I final would question. We would consider that an unapproved additive to the fruit as uh, well. We, we, we yeah. So then you're you're delving into other issues with like if that's would be considered a chemical contamination of your product. Okay. Final question. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. You're in the homestead selling, you know, at, at the end of your, your lane, your drive. Yeah. Um, can, what's the difference? What's the the different steps between selling at your house, say farmers markets? church fairs, grocery store. Like, is, is there any difference or no? The difference is you need a license. So uh, outside the house, you always need the oh, limit. Yeah, uh, off of your property. Like any kind of festival. Limited or the food establishment, but I would strongly recommend a limited only because it's a lot more manageable as a starting business to do the limited because there's much more lax regulations. Um, if you want- any, yeah, Anywhere you're selling for money. If yes. you're just taking like honey samples at an observation hive to say, hey, I'm selling at my house, whatever, here, but here's some samples. I mean, because you're not selling. I'm not going to come after you if you're doing a honey presentation and you're like, here, I tried a little honey. <laughs> this is what a hive looks like. Oh, by the way, I sell it at my house. I've got way bigger things going on. <laughs> like, it's just like, okay. okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank Suzanne. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.